you know, we're all working. That's that's what we do. We make money. It's a it's a big part of the way the world works. So uh, I don't believe like in the anti monetization part because a lot of there's there's a lot of like discussion bubbling around that like why does music have to be blah blah you know because everybody's so used to Spotify but we're in an age where artists are getting like fucked over more than ever and like are figuring out trying to figure out ways to make money um and i think something like sound if we were to adopt it as a as a you know on a on a, on a bigger scale and just normalize that sort of behavior of tipping music that you're into you know we we might see a lot of artists being able to live like fuller lives and bring more art to the world which is a world i want to live in you know what i mean Episode 53 of Invest in Music with Michael from Tools for Modern Life. Today we're here to talk about his new collection, Tool 002, and what it's like to start building an on-chain brand from the ground up. As a reminder, you can click this episode on investinmusic.xyz. I want to try a little experiment, so if you're listening to this intro, go ahead and reply to any of my casts with the word Tools FML, and I'm going to go ahead and tip you a thousand DJ. It's the best way to support our guests, so without further ado, let's get into it. Episode 53 of Invest in Music with Michael from Tools for Modern Life. All right, we are back. We got Michael online, the founder of Tools for Modern Life, joining us today from the studio. What's going on, brother? Hi, how are you, Cooper? Doing well, man. It's a uh, funny, funny interview here that we're doing this from while well, I'm in Brooklyn right now. I just got out here for a show tomorrow night, but you're also a Hollywood guy. So, you know, it's funny that we're doing this interview cross country, despite the fact that you're also an L.A. based artist yourself. But for those who don't yeah. know about you, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Michael Online. I am a, I'm a 26 year old producer, songwriter, uh, artist, visual artist. Uh, I'm from Miami, Florida. Grew up in Miami, Florida, born and raised. And um, yeah, I've been in LA for about four and a half years, uh, just making music, grinding, and learning new shit. <laughs> when did you move out Trying to LA? To like, stuff. what was the impetus of leaving Miami and getting out here to LA? Um, it just kind of felt like the thing to do. I'd been trying to make plays in music in Miami for a while, sometimes successfully, most of the time not. And uh, I definitely just wanted to go somewhere more serious that friends, older friends were kind of already going. You know, I had a lot of friends from Florida already dip out over here and kind of make a name for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I figured, why not? Why not make the leap? And uh, I like that. yeah, it all it all kind of worked out. It's been it's been pretty cool. What was your earliest relationship with music growing up in Miami, Florida? Was it something that you were pursuing from a very young age or did you pick it up a little bit later in life? Um, I think definitely like I, I took on music like during my formative years. So I think I, I picked up like my first demo copy of uh, FL Studio when I was like 11 years old. Um, my mom had. Cause we were, we, she's a big Kanye fan. She was like day one on Kanye when he was doing like his college tours back in the day, she saw him perform. Mom, I have a young mom. She had me really, really young. So she's probably like 25 at this point. You know what I mean? And I'm fully cognitive. I'm like six years old. And uh, she was, she was telling me about how Kanye would make his beats. Cause I would, I would, I would always wonder how instrumentals worked in relation to like music. You know, when you're young, you're trying to just make connections and figure shit out uh, without any real <laughs> guidance because you're learning elementary school stuff. So I, I'm I'd listen to music. I'd hear music in the car on the way to school and I'd be like, are the words like happening at the same time as the as this? Like, what's going on there? What is that? You know, I had no concept on how music was being made. And I would ask my mom silly questions and stuff like that about that sort of thing. And one day she was telling me about how Kanye west one of her favorite artists is he makes his own beats that was like a big thing for an mm -hmm. artist to be doing at the time um and, sh and i thought nothing of it for a couple years but then eventually i got my first little ipod nano i started getting really into kanye lupe fiasco uh jay-z kid cuddy was starting to come out around that time i think i might have been like 11 12 kid cuddy was coming out with a man on the moon and i decided i wanted to make beats too um, so I, I looked up on YouTube, I probably how to make beats and, uh, I, I found a kid 
he was a kid not much older than me making beats on fl studio and yeah i said fuck it got the the demo version on my mom's laptop damn i fucked that laptop up with so many viruses from just downloading stuff all the time being a little shithead but uh can i curse on you yeah yeah are you good good. all right cool 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 um i'm a pretty vulgar person sometimes but um yeah i got that demo version never figured out how to actually get the the real version without paying for it until i was like maybe 17 and i actually could afford it so yeah i was just writing the demo version of that for years making beats they were all they all sucked but i I was learning i think like my first full beat arrangement when i learned how to get out of the small fl studio grid was uh i was remaking a millie by lil wayne Mm. that was like my first time arranging a beat in full so yeah kind of a long answer but i definitely started young yeah I mean, it's pretty fascinating that your mom was seeing uh, Kanye West when he was starting to do his first shows. I mean, that's like a pretty full circle moment and honestly pretty rare because I've actually never heard of someone seeing Kanye in his earliest years. And I guess it's an interesting tangent for me because my relationship with you is through sound. You know, when I first heard about your music, it was very like hyper pop influence. I know that there's a lot of different genres that are there, but I was definitely impressed that you were also pretty hip to like the electronic scene. You knew about people like Son Holo and whatnot. So What was your journey of going from like starting out making hip hop beats on FL Studio to getting more into genres like hyper pop, things like electronic music? Like how did that whole kind of world evolve for you? Shit, it was a a kind of a natural funnel for me because like um, Kanye being my formative artist, like the main one and uh, being such a heavy producer who was like very, very inspired and a lot of times you could kind of point straight to some of the stuff he was deriving from. It was like real art house, artsy kind of kind of shit, like Mr. Hudson, a lot mm-hmm. of crazy melodic stuff that you wouldn't just be hip to like that. But that Kanye was, especially when he sort of pivoted into 808s and Heartbreak. So I always kind of like wanted to explore the more melodic, high art sort of level of music, even though trap beats was all I knew how to like really articulate through a DAW at the time. Um, So my musical journey eventually would lead inevitably to me like learning how to put together like proper melodic music, you know, but it's it was it's really cool to start from hip hop. And I feel like you see a lot of kids starting from hip hop and then going on to do other things because hip hop is a really good way to learn the basics of creating Mm -hmm. Uh, a beat man or or just a song like it's it's served to you on such a platter where you can like you know i could hear any metro booming track and just sort of dissect that and that's what i was on in my younger years you know metro was coming out and i'd just be on the trap beats just listening and literally like oh i know that hat i know that kick i know that that sub and uh you 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 gain a knack for 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 putting together instrumentals and eventually, I think people like to 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 put that shit to to use on a on a on a bigger stage. I feel like transitioning out of hip hop or just transitioning into doing more shit other than just hip hop is a very natural thing that's been happening with a lot of my friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, just you know, on an anecdotal tip, just kids I know, we're all doing it. <laughs> you know, yeah, it, it's just kind of a natural thing. I, I don't even think it's too personal. You know, you start getting exposed to more stuff. You get older, you learn how to use a keyboard better. And you, you want to experiment naturally. You want to get out of that shell. Um, so that that's what happened with me. And it manifested in a bunch of different ways. Like, uh, aside from more the more digital sounding stuff I do, like I've got stuff that sounds like straight up band music where I'm just playing guitar and we got some, some fake drums going, stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it's... It's it, it's a it's a journey, but I think a lot of kids start at hip hop and then just sort of branch off from there. And it's it's beautiful to see. And what did that progression look like for you? So you're getting FL Studio when you're 11, right? Let's say that you're making mm-hmm. trap beats for the next few years. You said at this point, your homies are starting to move out to L.A. You know, you're probably in Miami. You're probably starting an artist project around that time. Like, when did you formally launch your artist project? And what did your journey and progression look like with relation to the type of pocket you were producing in? the type of sound that you wanted to be making? Like, where did you find yourself positioning your artist project relative to what was around you at the time? Yeah. Um, so I was I was kind of a, when I f- 
first first like decided I'm gonna record a record. I was like 14. It sucked because I I uh, my vocal cords just weren't developed yet. I didn't have a deep voice, so <laughs> I recorded a song. The bars were crazy. It was a it was a remix to like a childish Gambino song. I think it was Backpackers. You could it's literally on YouTube. If you look up Michael Backpackers, it's a thing. But it's just me sounding like a straight up kid. And uh, so I was like, All right, I got bars, but I got to I got to save that until <laughs> until I could back it up with like a, you know, a certain bravado to my voice. Um, maybe that wasn't the right decision, though. I look back like, man, I should have been recording. But uh, so, yeah, I put that off for like three more years. So like from 14 to 17, I was like, I'm not recording anything. I'm just going to I'm going to keep producing and started for producing for other kids because naturally with like the boom of SoundCloud that was kind of going around, that was going on like right around my teenage years. Uh, everyone around me started wanting to make music too. Mm -hmm. So I'm having kids come over. I'm doing sessions. I'm like, oh, 50 a song, 30 a song. I'll mix it this time or whatever. You know, just stupid little kid deals. We're, we're exchanging lunch money for <laughs> for beats and, and services, which was really cool. I had like a little hub outside of my My mom was really annoyed with me. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was kind of running a small little business out of my room where I could, uh, I was, I was letting my skills grow. Um, so that was cool. And eventually I was like, man, I should, I should just fucking record. Like I'm like 17 now. I, I, I have ideas. I want to, I want to be an artist, but I've just been afraid. Um, so I start and naturally I feel like I was pretty fucking trash at the time. I think any artist will tell you that about themselves 10 years ago. But yeah, that's 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 how I felt. Um eventually it's it's like we spoke. I I started shifting away from hip hop and just kind of wanting to sing over things. And I started getting more obsessed with the idea of like being a good singer and uh being a good songwriter and like what that means and why I look up to people who are like that. It was really like Pharrell that took it there for me because Pharrell is this guy who like on one end you have an insane hip hop producer, hella accolades. And a lot of his placements are people that you would never hear singing. And it's like totally not melodic at all, but it bangs and it knocks and it's fucking sick. Um, but then he's writing crazy like jazz infused love songs that like all the girls are fucking with. And I was like, all right, this is a guy who's got that duality. You know, he's he's doing this thing on one end and then he's kind of doing his really artsy thing on another end and one's funding the other. And it's this whole cool ecosystem that Pharrell had built around himself and his production, which continues to this day. He's still the man. Um, and he kind of yeah, he took it there for me where I was like, oh, I, I could open up. Um, I could I could kind of like move on to other things. I want to I want to learn how to play the keys. I want to learn how to manipulate a Juno, you know, uh, you know, work on a synth, which I saw, I think the Neptunes kind of put me on to was like working with synthesizers and stuff. So yeah, it naturally, it naturally evolved from there. Just everything for me was who I was looking up to and how they, it, it, me wanting to be them so bad and like how I figured I would become like that. Those are the ways in which I've evolved and it, it never ends up how you think it's going to be like, I'm not Pharrell. <laughs> or Tyler Creator or any of these other people who like so deeply influenced me. I'm I'm Michael now, which is which is cool. Yeah. Nice. And so if you think about the transition going out to LA, was there a conscious point in your life when you're like, yo, I want to get out of Florida, I want to go to LA and pursue this more seriously? Or like what was that that moment in your career when you decided like I'm cool with running, selling fifty dollar beats out of Miami. I want to go try and make it out in LA. Yeah. Um I've been living alone for like two years already at this point. I'm like, I'm like 20 years old, 21 years old. And, uh, I have this crib. It's like 400 bucks for me to stay in. It's awesome. But, uh, the depression was just setting in like crazy. And, uh, you know, naturally you're young. People want to, they, they come live with you and like the roommate situations are hella weird and funny because nobody knows how to live alone. <laughs> so I had, all sorts of drama surrounding my house and just was dealing with a lot of like a uh, kind of unnecessary young man bullshit for lack of a better term, just like dealing with other young men who are also confused and trying to find themselves. And I was like, I, I, I really should like 
leave. <laughs> I should I should leave and I should I should go do something productive. I should go be with my homies who are over there doing things that I admire. Um so I eventually I had one homie who his finesse kind of to come here was to go through the college system and uh go to Musicians Institute. He 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 went right here to Musicians it's a couple blocks from where I'm at right now. And uh he had been in their program. He was telling me it's awesome. You get a bunch of studio time around the clock. You can, you're, you're obviously, you're going to learn, um, which I value still. I wasn't just going to college for no reason, but uh, I decided, all right, cool. I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this Musicians Institute thing. And I'm just going to like let the housing be on the tuition or whatever and just figure it out and like get a small job. So I'm not a loser while I'm out there. And that's what I did. I, I came out, um, I enrolled in college before I came out had a like worked crazy hours in Miami for a little bit just so I could have like $2,000 when I came, which was cool, which really held me over. And then I, uh, yeah, I did college for like six months and worked at Best Buy <laughs> and uh, eventually the pandemic hit. So it was like six months of college from October, 2019 to like May or April, 2020 boom pandemic and uh yeah that was that was like how i came to la just and i'm gonna i'm gonna take a guess here that mm -hmm. during covid is you told me you know off this interview about your your origins with crypto which was like getting into nfts and stuff like that i'm assuming this was around the time frame when that shit started to pop up and when you started to dive down that rabbit hole yeah my my web 3 indoctrination was like right around the start of 2021 yeah there's a little gap there, but for sure it was still pandemic era. And what was that uh, indoctrination story? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a really cool homie in English, and he, uh, he's just a fucking Web three D five D gen addict. I, I love him. He's like amazing. He's made me <laughs> a bunch of money <laughs> without needing to, and uh, he's got a Discord with other D gens just like him. And a lot of these dudes are really smart a lot of these dudes are like you know solidity developers and stuff like that and just complete complete dgens at the same time just aping into shit making calls <laughs> i'm sure you, i'm sure you've, you've you've been a part of a couple servers like this just like straight up dgen brain rot we're throwing shit at the wall you know we're on stake.com gambling but Luckily, he's, he's never steered me wrong, and he's always given me the alpha on people that were – or projects that were doing cool whitelist opportunities. So uh, the first one was Small Bodies. So that was, that was a project on Treasure DAO via Arbitrum. And uh, they were literally just doing a meme contest. And I made the most bullshit meme, which got me two Small Body free mints, no capital up front which is another part of like my web three stories that I never really had to like <laughs> pay any money to get involved. I was working off strictly whitelists and airdrops and like free mints were kind of a thing late 2021. Uh, so I got these two small bodies. I ended up selling one for, I think like AK and the other for like 10, <laughs> some fucked number like that. I, I'd got to go on ether scan and check, but it was a. Uh, I, I made a fucked amount of money off these two NFTs. I, I I held one because I knew there were drops coming if you held one. So I sold the first one, butterfingered it, paper handed it. It was great. Got a bunch of money from that, and then I kind of chilled, held my second one, and waited until they like airdropped another token or asset, which also got me a good chunk of money. And then I did the same thing for uh, Kaiju Mutants. There was like a Kaiju Mutant. That's a you familiar it's like a layer layer one eth project same type of deal i'd made a song for them in the discord and uh that was another i don't think it was a free mint but damn near free that was another uh asset i was able to get and then um i think my third one was chimpers chimpers is another layer one eth project that i also did uh, a couple songs for in their discord and got a whitelist for which really hooked it up <laughs> so yeah like the, that's uh, that's that's my web3 journey oh actually i like that go ahead yeah, you want to add something I, yeah no i i totally forgot that um before these these crazy whitelists 
mints that I was able to get, I was I was working really hard on this app called Hicketnunk, which is basically like Zora on Tezos. I can never pronounce that shit. Yeah, or Hicketnunk. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. I don't even know yeah, how you say it, but weird little Latin. Yeah, I've never heard anyone say it out loud. But uh yeah, I was I was working really hard on there. Like I was like learning 3D modeling while like uploading my my demo exports and just like calling it art and making a good little amount of cash on there. And that's how my boy Gleesh kind of took notice that I was interested. Um, Sick. Yeah. What I really like about that, though, is it's uh, very similar to my journey in crypto in the sense that I earned most of my early ETH from just like working in the space. And I think for you, it was making songs and finding ways to like get on these allow lists from like memes and whatnot. I was mm -hmm. just writing blogs about most of this shit. I was just getting people to pay me to like write about DeFi projects, write about tokens, doing on chain governance work. And I think it's important to vocalize because I think people look at crypto and they look at it as like a giant. 401k hedge fund investment type thing. And I think for mm -hmm. a lot of creatives and artists specifically, they get really afraid of it because they see it as this giant like finance thing. But one thing that I always found very attractive about the space and that I think there's a lot of synergies here is that like you can really like earn your way into the space. And I think, you know, we're going to start talking a little bit more about sound in a second here, but it's something that I tell a lot of artists today, which is like, yo, you don't have to buy ETH to like be into crypto. You don't have to buy yeah. Bitcoin and have like this you know, huge financial obligation where you're like, oh, I put in 5,000 bucks, is it up or it down? And now you have this whole like mental relationship with it. Like if you're just putting your music out on sound, it doesn't cost any money to upload it. You don't need to have ETH. It's free to upload and you make ETH for putting your music on chain. And I feel like it's a really uh, interesting starting point for you because you kind of had this working capital to get, get out the gate with. And now you kind of have this understanding of how the space moved and operated. And I remember when we first connected, I was definitely very surprised to hear that you have that level of experience with the space because i think that most artists who are coming on chain today they don't have any prior relationship with crypto you know i think there's now this yeah. kind of like big change that's happening where in the past it was like people came in from icos they came in from DeFi, they came in from nfts through meme coins whatever it is and they came in with this you know expectation of being able to flip some shit on the internet you know it doesn't matter if it's yeah. ico if it's NFTs, whatever it is, like they came in with this expectation that I'm going to buy some shit for $100 and sell it for $10,000. Or in the case of you, you're like, I'm not going to put in $100, but I'm going to make a song, which is, I guess, technically worth two songs if you're making beats for $50 a pop. In your bedroom <laughs> but, yeah. you know, you kind of put in this work and now you have this investment in the space. And I feel like now we're kind of entering this phase where people don't, I'm hoping on the creative side, I'm hoping that artists don't have this expectation of needing to like flip shit when they come into the space, they can just like put music out on sound. And so I guess yeah. kind of fast forwarding a little bit there, I first got introduced to you through a good friend of ours named Naomi. Uh, she's the homie. She said, oh, you got to meet this kid. He makes amazing music. And then when we first chatted, you just told me that story about you selling small brains. And I thought that that was very interesting because I wasn't used to people like having at this point in time with like music NFTs and on-chain music, I wasn't used to people having like crypto experience. I was basically used to having to teach people like, yo, this is ETH, this is MetaMask, like here's all this annoying bullshit they have to do to use the space. And so yeah. I guess my question to you would be like, how did you go from being like an NFT flipper, for lack of a better term, <laughs> to being like an artist that wanted to start releasing their music on sound and kind of playing around with some of these new platforms? Yeah, yeah, let's let's take it there. Um... Well, I, I guess the the inception of tools came about because it checked so many boxes for me. Um, on one end, I'll just kind of cover each box, I guess. Um, on one end, I've always thought of like being a builder in the space, right? And the presumption I've always had is that I'm not connected enough and it's hard to get connected enough for that sort of thing. And it's also hard to apply yourself once connected. You know, it's a... There's a lot that has to align for you to, you know, be successful at anything. So a lot of times I sort of doubt how I can get something popping anywhere. Um, but I am somebody who's really focused on sort of building a better financial future for myself, having the free time to be able to work and make music, which is what I love. I want that to be my only job in life. Uh, so the first job uh, box it checked was like, yeah, I can build something in crypto and it's not going to take like any weird effort that I'm not used to putting in. Like 
no, I'm making music, which is what I know how to do. And I'm bringing value to a space which people care about, which I got to give it to you. Like you're kind of one of the people that showed me that there's people rooting for and like giving a super fuck about this music, this on-chain music space. Um, so seeing that, seeing, you know, your past successes with who you've worked with too, I was like, man, I, there's no reason I shouldn't maybe try to attack this. And I want to attack it in an interesting way. Um, so yeah, that's the first box I checked is that it was a cool way to sort of maybe monetize just what I'm already doing on top of, you know, being able to build something and bring value in a space that's constantly growing and evolving. And I want to be involved. I feel like a creator at heart and I should strive to be a creator in any space that I decide to involve myself in. Right. And, uh, the third box it checked is more of a personal, uh, sort of exploration thing is I wanted to see how it looks when I apply myself to making this much fucking music all the time. Uh, you know, as, as an artist, you know, I've, I've done, I've done pretty well on the web two side of things. Um, I just passed 2 million streams on my biggest song scream and run. And one of the main things I have to say about like why it's kind of hard to be an artist in the traditional sense of like just putting music out on, you know, DSPs and all the traditional channels or avenues uh, is that there's a lot of like, at least for me, right. A lot of like weird, ego attached to it where it's like oh, i made this song but like this isn't hitting in this way or like how does this fare up to the shit i just dropped uh a couple months ago is this a good way to follow up this single all these thoughts that go into it and a lot of times it leads to just me like not wanting to make music at all it, it's a really scary thing very psychological thing that happens with just sur surrounding wanting to release music and being a part of the you know, DSP ecosystem, just the traditional music ecosystem. So this was a cool way to push myself in the direction of just like, no, fuck that. Make a shit ton of music. Make it all good. You don't have to put your words on it. And cherry on top, it gets to be a completely separate brand. It gets to be a completely separate brand that's being introduced to the world. And you can just go full steam on that because there's no ego attached to it. Make something cool. Put it out you've got the right people in your corner who will help you spread the word. Um, and that's kind of where tools came about. It was me checking those three boxes and be like, damn, this is a, this is a great way to kind of move forward. And now it's just in two months of it being a thing has been become such a like central part of my thinking in terms of my career path and career trajectory. Why don't we take a step back for a second for people who have not heard of tools before give us a quick breakdown on the project as a whole how you're thinking about it i know that there's a white paper that you put out that says more about it but you know one of the things that was attractive to me about this project is that it was bigger than just like a song you know like you definitely had a vision for what you wanted this to be you had kind of an idea and an identity around it give us kind of like the ten thousand foot view on what tools is yeah so if you if you really really zoom out tools is a uh it's an it's an all-encompassing brand right um and right now our main product is a monthly series of music that's designed to evoke certain emotions and evoke like um deep thought or pretty much whatever you want out of it you can get which is uh kind of what i was going for i i've sort of built up a relationship with instrumental music recently. Just listening to Aphex Twin and like Joy Orbison, Overmono, uh, Porter Robinson, people like that. And just, uh, I was really tapping into the fact that like, damn, it, it hits different when no one's singing. <laughs> There's something different about this. There's something that makes me feel at ease with this um, and in all sorts of different ways. You know, Aphex Twin would come on and that's a completely different vibe than like, you know, say any track off of Nurture by Porter Robinson. But they're both instrumentals and they both give you different feelings. Um, and I was like, damn, that's that's a really cool way to communicate feelings because I'm always thinking about songwriting, songwriting, songwriting. It's always on the back of my mind. What am I going to say on this? For once, I don't have to think that anymore, you know, uh, which was super attractive to me. 
so I wanted to deliver those emotions uh, in in a in a nice package. So I thought I had the the idea to make these sort of ambient projects and just give them each a theme, stick to that theme when making the music, and then deliver it. And what I want people to do is take the music and rearrange it, repurpose it. Like if you zoom out, you'll see, you know, 40 collections in people making playlists that were like completely unintended by me when creating the original sets of songs uh, and sharing those and minting off of those together and just sort of like kind of a Pokemon trading card vibe of like, yo, here's my playlist. Like this is really good for like if you're in the gym or whatever, or uh, dude, read a book while this is on, just play this real low and just like read your favorite book. Like this might, this might really lock you in. Um, it's just encouraging people to have that sort of relationship with music where it's sort of uh, you can view it as a um, sort of a supplement or a medication rather than, you know, Oh, Drake just dropped for lack of a better, you know, just, you know, Drake just dropped. We gotta, we gotta check the shit out. Oh, he dissed whoever, like there's a, there's a lot of stuff that comes with traditional music. And this is just sort of a break from that and a, a different, a repurposed view on music, which I'm trying to push. Right. Um, but I also, I don't want to like push that perspective on anyone either. Like if you just want to enjoy some dope shit, I'm also, I've also checked the box that it's also just dope shit. If you want it to be that too. Yeah. Um, so people can take for whatever they want from it. And I think that's pretty cool. And that's, that's what tools is. Yeah. I like the, uh, the composable nature of it. You know, it feels very aligned with sort of the intention of products and platforms that are building on chain in the sense that you can have a song in tool 001 transit that fits really nice next to tool 002 synchronicity. And to your point, like you take the pack seven pack 12 and you mix them all together. I think there's some really cool things that can happen on the back of it. And for me too, you know, the idea of building a brand around a sonic style is very compelling to me. You know, I think you see this a lot with labels when they're going after certain subgenres, but this almost feels like it has a lot wider intention and a lot wider reach because it's not meant to be like, in your face of like you were saying with like a Drake disc or anything like that. Like it's not trying to say anything too crazy. You know, you position it to me as like, listen to this on your way to work or listen to this when you're on the train or something like that. And it's not meant to be, mm -hmm. at least in, in my perspective, how I've been receiving it is it's not meant to be like the core thing that you're like, holy shit, what did this guy, guy just say? Like, it's like capturing my attention to the point where it's the main focal point. Like it's meant to be kind of this background music that encourages and enhances yeah. your cognition but in a way that feels like really additive versus it being very in your face and i think for me it was really interesting to come out of the gate with this project and say like hey here's a body of work it's not just one song here's zero zero one here's the first pack of five songs you know as of the time of this episode coming out here's zero zero two the second pack of songs and i think it's just set a really strong foundation and so i definitely want to talk a little bit about how you rolled it out things like farcaster etc but before we get into that you know, anything you want to add into like the kind of way that you rolled this out, you know, the choice to only release the songs on sound XYZ or kind of what your general philosophy was with how you decided to bring this project to life. Yeah. Um, I think the, the reason it's on sound exclusively right now is that I don't, I didn't want to rush things either. I wanted to let this sort of develop where there's not too many eyes on it, which is where I sort of thrive. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good at building when no one's looking and sounds the perfect touch of that. We're like, we can get a lot of people involved, but this won't, this won't make any waves in my web to audience, which I don't want. Cause then it attaches those, those, uh, those egotistical feelings of like, well, does my call online need to be doing blah, blah, blah right now? Is this what's, you know, uh, so there, I, that created a good separation there. And I was like, all right, so cool, cool. Let's, let's go all in on sound. Let's like sound max it. And that's been really fun because it forced me to sort of really, really ingratiate myself into that ecosystem. And, you know, now I'm collecting more than ever and I'm posting and I'm fine. I'm having a lot of fun on sound just because the user experience is actually like pretty fucking enjoyable if you decide to go all in on it and, and really be involved and collect, you know? At, at every level which, so yeah which to be fair is like not a lot of people and i want to give you credit for that and naomi someone i would give credit for this um music ben 
Music Garden. You know, there's a few people out there. Like, I would say, all things considered, I could be totally off on this. There's probably like 100 people around sound, like, giving a fuck right now. You know what I mean? Mm. Like, actually out here, like, collecting shit, posting shit, sharing shit. And it's very funny to, like, say that out loud because I see this vision for what it can become. And I think to your point, you're seeing all these ways that this is cool, exciting, and novel, but it just hasn't, like, clicked in a really mainstream way yet. But I look at a project like Tools and it feels very resonant of like this new era of on-chain music where to take a step back, early sound, early catalog is like you drop 25 editions of a song, you make five grand, it's fucking hype, it sells out in the first second, it's like life-changing amounts of money, people are loud <laughs> about it, they're talking, they're on Twitter spaces, they're posting to their homies, being like, I fucking love yeah. crypto. And then music people are like, what is going on over there? I don't want to be around that. Like, that's like weird to me. Like it doesn't have a good energy. Like it seems like it's fast money. Like it seems like it's not really real or whatnot. Market dies down, right? Sound pivots their whole fucking business. They're now this like social platform. I don't want to say pivoted their whole business, but for all intents and purposes. And now you have a project like tools and it's like, look, this thing costs $2 to collect. It's meant to be something nice and fun. You post about it. You share it with your friends. You share it on the feed, someone else collects it, you make a couple cents on the back of it. It's got these cool elements in place, but it feels like it's in a lot more organic and natural place now. And even though there's not as many people as there was before, I feel like the vibe is better to me because it's not like trying to be something that it's not. And it's not promoting these like really unsustainable behaviors of like making fuck tons of money in 10 seconds and then just like having to always catch your tail on like needing to top that. And I guess I'm curious from your yeah. perspective, if you felt that as like the creator of tools or kind of what your sentiment is with kind of the current state of on-chain music as a whole right now. Yeah. Um, so like my kind of one of my opinions, one of my bigger opinions on on-chain music as a whole is that I don't believe it should be, you know, a sort of speculative cash grab economy, you know, which I'm glad it's not. Um, I'm glad people are able to just sort of put music up as they normally would. And people are collecting it as they would buy a song on iTunes, like 15 years ago, you know, that's, there's something cool about the fact that people are just going back to doing that. And granted, yeah, it's, it's a smaller audience, but it's lovers of music, which as somebody who loves music and wants to make music for lovers of music, it's a, it's a match made in heaven. Right. So I love that I'm able to just, go directly to those guys or those people um, and bring that sort of product. There's um, I, I've, I've, I've looked into a lot of, you know, these, the, the crazy speculative moments that happened like in the last bull run with music. And while that shit is super sick and like so happy for any artist who's able to make like a crazy bag um, that doesn't, I don't, I don't think that's, that works for artists as a whole in a model like this is much more attainable and doable for like the next person, which is how we get to mainstream adoption. And this, that is how we bring sort of the world on chain, <laughs> you know, uh, a shit actually being attainable, you know, somebody looking at yeah. tools and be like, Oh, why, why don't I do whatever? You know, why don't I get involved on sound? Why don't I start doing my thing on there? Um, and actually being able to do it and actually being able to make a chunk of change on it, which is, you know, we're all working. That's that's what we do. Yeah. We make money. It's a it's a big part of the way the world works. So uh, I don't believe like in the anti monetization part. There's a lot of there's a, there's a lot of like discussion bubbling around there. Like, why does music have to be blah? blah you know, because everybody's so used to Spotify. But we're in an age where artists are getting like fucked over more than ever, and like are figuring out trying to figure out ways to make money. Um. And I think something like sound, if we were to adopt it as a, as a, you know, on a, on a, on a bigger scale and just normalize that sort of behavior of tipping music that you're into, you know, we, we might see a lot of artists being able to live like fuller lives and bring more art to the world, which I, is a world I want to live in. You know what I mean? I agree. And I like that you yeah. use the word attainable there, because I think that tipping is a good analogy for the current state of collecting. Where I think mm -hmm. early on you were buying, it's very similar to your experience you had with small bodies where you're buying this very limited rare thing. You're seeing people sell them for five, 10 grand. You're expecting it to go higher. So you don't know if you want to hold it or you want to sell it or whatnot. Now for all intents and purposes, we're just in the tip culture, which is like, yo, I fuck with the song. 
but I pick it up. It costs two dollars every time I buy something for two dollars. The artist is going to get like a dollar eighty or something like that, and it's pretty sick. I mean, from my perspective, like putting out a song a day recently, like we're working with a bunch of artists who are getting, you know, let's call it hundred thousand streams on their new singles that are coming out on Spotify, and that's great for them. But like, you know, we run the numbers here, and they're making hundred bucks off that song. Then they come on sound and they see that they got. 300 mints and they made like 400 bucks and they made like 600 yeah. bucks. And like, you know, at the end of the day, it's not like I'm out here trying to say that sounds making life changing money for people, but like it actually is stacking up with like the income that independent artists are making off of putting their music on Spotify and grinding TikTok and grinding Instagram reels and shit like that. And, you know, I think the way that I've been thinking about on chain music is like by just giving people a way to support the artist directly, we're starting to see that those rates are competitive to like a global streaming model. And I think one thing that I would yeah. just add a little color on that you mentioned earlier is like, I really love that there are people on sound who are like diehard music lovers and that want to collect it to support the music because they love the music. I would consider myself that person. I would consider you that person, the people we mentioned in this podcast, those people. But I think that now we're in this era too, where we need to get outside of expecting everyone to love music to want to support it. And what I mean by that is like, we're going to transition now to talking about Farcaster. We've been selling a lot of music on Farcaster because people just want to tap into new platforms and just see what's going on. Like when you look at a person that's collecting a song on Farcaster, they're probably not like a diehard music fan. They're just down to spend $2 transacting with a frame because it's just fun and novel and interesting. And it's two yeah. bucks. It's not like a huge lift or anything. They don't have this expectation of getting a FaceTime with the artist. They don't have an expectation of, this one of 25 limited thing being worth hundred thousand dollars. Like it feels a lot more attainable in the sense that not only is it cheaper, but it's now removing this huge music barrier, which is to say like, I'm only going to buy this because I love music to now going to more of like, I'm just going to support this thing. Cause like, I like this song or like, maybe I don't love this song. Maybe I don't love this artist. Maybe I don't consider myself like a diehard music fan, but like, I fuck with tools, you know, like I put this on and I like this song and I want to kind of give back. And the way that I do that is tipping the artist by collecting it for $2. And so I guess going into that side of the equation, you know, you're one of the the few artists who I've seen make a conscious effort to build a brand and audience on, on Farcaster. I know it's not easy, but can you talk a little bit more about how that's been for you and the tools project and kind of some of the takeaways you have from that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a crazy little space, dude. I, I, it was like a culture shock for me to pull up on Farcaster and see what people are chirping about on there, bro. It's a, it's a whole different vibe than Twitter because um, it's kind of what I wished Twitter was when I was trying to get into things in the last bull run. You know, uh, just straight alpha everywhere <laughs> and people just discussing on-chain shit is really yeah. cool. Uh, of course, there's there's discussions outside of on chain stuff, but it's it's a contained environment where you can really like you can fuck with projects directly or developers directly and just get in the mix. And everybody knows that everybody's there is cool because it's kind of like at least in its current state, it's like if you're here, you know, something, you know. Uh, So, yeah, I, th I thought it was a nifty, cool little place to like if I'm starting an on chain brand and trying to make a name for this brand in the space why not right so that was kind of the, the mentality i had going into using farcaster and then eventually it ended up like oh i'm enjoying this i'm enjoying the discourse i'm enjoying uh exchanging words with people who are also like bullish on uh, the state of crypto and like what what they want to see in the future and you know i love your thought-provoking tweets uh they're, they're cool you see me interact i could just call them tweets <laughs> but it casts Happens um, all the time. Yeah, because it feels so much like Twitter. But um, yeah, I, I love interacting with your posts. I love the DGen model. I'm just like, damn, if, if you like what somebody just said, throw a little DGen uh, their way. That's not even, it's not taking in anything out of your wallet. You're just, you have an allowance. Just give it out, you know? Uh, it's really cool. It's just a, it's just a cool space. And I, I thought it was a no brainer for like, if I'm starting an on-chain brand to just get on there and get active. And it's yeah. been fun, you know, it's been a slow grind, but you know, if you zoom out, it's how it is at the, at the beginning of anything. So hundred percent, I think that's a really yeah. healthy perspective to have. And from my, from my standpoint, that was kind of my relationship with it too. I think like six months ago, I saw this group of people starting to use it a lot more frequently, people that I knew and respected in the space. And they were talking about very on-chain specific things, but not in the format of like, 
what's going to make us a thousand X on our return, but more from the standpoint of like, how do we advance the space forward? How do we build better consumer products? How do we make it more easy and accessible for people to use this space? And for me, it just gave me an opportunity to be like really open about being like, yo, mobile crypto sucks ass. Like I can't connect any of these apps, like using MetaMask on my phone blows. And people are like, I agree, this does blow. Like, how do we make it better? Yeah. And I think the progression of going from that to then being able to be a quote unquote builder, to use one of your terms from earlier, on Farcaster and building frames that let people collect music directly from a Twitter client is pretty game fucking changer. cool. It's yeah, the fact that changer. I can go into Warcast and I can interact with the frame for a project like Tools, click a button that says collect. And if I follow the Coop Records account, if I follow the Tools account, I can get a free mint. We're on the back end on sound, it mints the record, the artist gets paid. But then on the consumer side, you get a free edition of the song. That was sick. And so I think now we're starting to explore with like, how do we actually start to monetize these records more actively on platform? And so I'm sure you saw this, but like even this week, I've been doing collect a record on sound and I'm going to tip you DJ. And so what I'll do is I'll be like, buy this record on sound. It costs $17 and I'm going to give you $50 worth of DJ. And for those who don't know much about how it works, an account like me on Warpcast, they get a daily allowance in DGen, which means I just get to give it to people for free. It's not tokens that are in my wallet. It's not tokens that I bought and I'm giving out to someone else. I just have this like ongoing tip balance. And so I get to use my balance that I've accrued from getting posts and interactions on the platform mm -hmm. to give it out to people for doing shit that I think is exciting. And so, you know, when you look at sound, you're just seeing these songs start to get more mints. But what's really fascinating about it is that it, for all intents and purposes, it's not coming from sound as the primary source. Like it's actually coming from a different platform. People are fucking around with frames. They're fucking around with wanting DGen and whatnot. And, you know, I'm kind of in this interesting headspace where I think for a while I was so focused on only trying to speak to music lovers. I was like, okay, invest in music. Fans become collectors. Like all music fans should want to collect music because it lets you get closer to the artist. It's like the most pure way you can support the work. And for my personal journey, it's like I got to meet all my favorite artists by buying their NFTs. And so like for me, I'm like, it's a no brainer. Like obviously if you're a music fan, you should buy music NFTs because you're going to get to meet these artists. But now I've kind of come full circle. I was like, yo, most people don't have that same experience and they don't want to be like collecting to meet the artists. They just want to do shit that's like cool. And so now it's almost like I'm selling music to crypto people instead of trying to sell like crypto to music people because yeah. selling crypto to music people is fucking impossible and people hate crypto <laughs> that are in music. So yeah. we're kind of in this interesting in between. And I think this episode with tools specifically is very relevant because I consider tools to be a project in a brand that I think really well exemplifies being able to sell music to crypto people in a way that just feels nice and natural. And like, it's not trying to be anything other than what it is. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to buy into like my journey as an artist or anything like that. It's, it's just music, which is really cool. With the ability to then step into it. And so I guess if we transition this episode into like future plans for tools, I know that you've obviously put a lot of thought into this. As I mentioned before, you kind of wrote out this whole white paper for what it's going to become. You mentioned being able to mix and match tools in the future. You know, paint me a, a, a really pretty picture. Everything's going well. 12 months from now, what do you think the tools ecosystem kind of looks like? Dude, uh, definitely a fucking app with stem separation on it. <laughs> or, uh, you know, since since we'll be a more advanced operation at that point, uh, I'll probably just upload stems and have, have you be able to sort of mix and match for real, like, within elements of the song and just kind of run that through an app and then you can kind of like stim on it you know like all right this is this is my anxiety track hold up and then just sort of do your thing and you you got your own little you've, you've essentially you've got a tool with all your tools in it um that's that like that's that. something i've been thinking about this whole time was just like a crazy like sort of donda stem player type beat but like just on your phone with your collected uh nfts Mm. Your, your collected tools tracks, um, however you've acquired them, you, you got them right there in your little portal and you've got them with the stem separated. You can mix and match them. Uh, on top of that, just a uh, real life merch. I think it's a, uh, it's actually a cool enough brand to be on a shirt or like on merch. And, you know, I, I come from graphic design as well. So I definitely want to, you know, give out some, some products that you can actually wear uh, or hang up even you know uh that that that'd be a cool thing too and you know maybe discounts for holders stuff like that cool stuff for people who've been around you know 
maybe maybe throw throw some throw some bones their way too. I, I want to make sure that collect like early collectors are taken care of in some way, shape, or form with uh with some sort of special special. I just can't speak too much on it because I we haven't thought that far, right? But I want to expand the brand for sure. I don't see it as just being these these small collections of music. There's a uh, there's ideas for the future to to really take it elsewhere and still on chain in a lot of respects, but also, you know, sort of uh, start making moves in web two as well. Um, Cause that, that's how I feel like a marriage sh- uh, with, between web two and web three should be. I feel like if you're starting a brand on web three, you should be able to bridge it over to web two and get, get more support there as well. You know, it shouldn't always be exclusive. So yeah, the, Definitely 12 months from now, just branched out and doing more than just the collections, you know? Yeah. I agree with what you said, that it shouldn't only exist exclusively on chain, but I think it is really fun when brands make the most powerful parts of the project be enabled by the fact that something is on chain. And so what you mentioned there, of like the fact you need to collect the song to be able to make a remix of it or make a remint or whatever you want to call it. That's Mm -hmm. something that I think is really interesting. And I think when it comes to getting regular people to understand the value and why music is on chain, it's probably not going to be from them like tipping people. I think that it's more like crypto people that understand that mentality of like, yo, I just want to give this artist 0.001 ETH because I just made 10 ETH selling DJ type beat. But for like regular music people, if you're like, yo, just tip this artist $2 because you like this song, they don't really get that because they can just get any song in the world they want for nine ninety nine a month. And so for them, they're like, I don't really want to tip this artist $2. Like that doesn't feel like yeah. a very desired behavior to me. And so I think the way that you're thinking about making these product experiences be tied to the fact that you have to collect something it's very interesting to me and it's something that you know i just i just want to pull that out for a second because i have a lot of conversations with um my friend lucas he's an artist that goes by bloody white and he also has this very similar mentality to thinking about what on-chain music looks like in the world of like making it cool and exciting and accessible to like the real world and a lot of it has to come down with the fact that like when you collect something on chain that can actually unlock something for you on a product level that can unlock something for you on a music level. And I think we're still so early into that, that, you know, this new generation of on-chain music feels exciting in the sense that it's now much more about like, buy this thing for $2 and do something with it much more than it is Mm -hmm. about like, buy this thing for a hundred dollars and hope that it goes to a thousand dollars. And I think for me, it's been really interesting to watch that progression happen. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I don't think that just because shit is, you know, $2 to collect as a free edition means that we can't have things that are worth thousands of dollars as well but it feels like we're now at this like very realistic point of like okay it's largely crypto people that are collecting this shit it's basically two dollars to collect it you know the name of the game right now is to get the music into as many people's hands as possible and all Mm -hmm. intents and purposes i feel like that's a pretty good place for it to be so i guess like coming full circle with this whole conversation how are you feeling about tool 002 this new pack that just dropped you know any closing thoughts you might have about the current state of the project and where your head's at with everything Give us like a a vibe check kind of in closing here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think with the new collection, it definitely feels much closer to the OG vision that I had. I think first collection was sort of a proof of concept round. Super happy that it it got minted the shit out of. And uh, that really gave me, that gave me a lot of steam to go ahead and come even harder with 002. And uh, the sounds are just, <laughs> they're going crazy. Um, I've got a whole, a whole new vibe that I approached uh, the second collection with that I think is going to carry over and spill over into, into the even later ones. And what's cool about this is that people get to hear me become a better music producer just because of the, the nature of how this works, of having to put out five songs a month. You got to do anything like that on a monthly basis, you're going to get good at it. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm discovering shit. I'm getting a lot better at music. So I think it's safe to say the collections are going to sound better as we keep rolling. And, uh, we're going to keep the art looking nice too, man. I, I do want people to interact with the, the actual visual art of it as well. I work really hard on those and I, I, I hope people can maybe come to see them sort of as PFPs. I'd love to see people, sort of throwing those on as PFPs. They're a little bit designed to be that way. Um, so yeah, I just want to throw out that out there, but yeah, I'm, I'm bullish on the future of this cause it's really just 
going to get better and better and unravel. And I'm stoked to get a lot of guest producers on as well. I've got some, I love that. Re- yeah, I've got some really dope friends uh, making music who are, you know, have dope traditional fan bases. And uh, I think the name of the game here is to have them come do guest collections on tools and uh, sort of bring their fan base over. And, you know, and goal is I want to get a lot more people on chain interacting with sound and with on chain music because it's nothing to be scared of. And it's actually really cool. And it's a great way to support artists. And I would go so far as to say, and this may be super anecdotal, but I think it's the one of the best ways to support artists right now, aside from maybe buying merch at a show or like buying tickets to a show, just tipping out for songs. Um, it's it's a really good thing to do. And I, I want people to feel encouraged to do that. So hopefully tools sets a good example. Um, I know a lot of my friends are wanting to come on chain just because they see what I'm doing. So yeah, exciting times. I really like that, man. I really like that. And I really like the uh, the ambition and the vision for it, because I think that there is a spectrum that happens with releasing your music on chain, right? I think for most artists, to your point, they are very afraid of it. They're very scared of what it means. They're scared of the precedent of it. And so they'll put up a song, you know, they'll maybe throw it up there and not really want to lean into it too much. And I totally get that. I mean, I think if you go and you talk about NFTs on Instagram, people are going to roast you. And that's just the reality of the situation. <laughs> but I think yeah. the way that you are approaching this project in the sense of saying like, A, first and foremost, it's good music, but B, it has the opportunity to expand into a wider brand. It has the opportunity to bring new people on chain. I really appreciate that. You know, as someone who is a big collector myself, you know, when I think about supporting artists and founders and builders, I like to support people who have bigger plans for their music as it relates to what it is doing on chain. Because every artist has the ambition of wanting to be heard by as many people as possible to have their music really profoundly affect someone. And that's the reason why I love collecting and supporting music. But I think there is an even smaller pocket and I would put tools in this, which is like, not only is this great music, but it has the ability to make this space have a bigger impact in the world. And so I just want to commend you for, for just going for it. You know, you said yourself that you were uh, looking for some way to dive in and get more hands on. I think tools has really become a very special place for you to do that. And in closing thoughts here, if people want to get more involved, if they want to collect tools, if they want to read the white paper, if they want to know anything more about the project, what's the best place for them to do so? Yeah, I would say uh, definitely join the uh, tools channel on Farcaster. I think it's a forward slash tools FML, if not backslash. I don't know if it's a backslash or a forward slash, but yeah, tools FML channel on Farcaster. That's where I'm uh, doing all main updates. I'm also just posting on my regular account on X feels fucking weird to say that but yeah i'm posting on x regularly and i'm doing really cool videos and previews of the collections on dracula i'm trying to get into the the dracula ecosystem a little bit more too i I found that really interesting so we're uh we're posting collection previews on there so you can maybe get a feel for how the music's being made um you know i'm posting videos of me working on it and stuff like that too so yeah uh Definitely check me out on Instagram, Michael.online. That's where you'll see everything I do ever. So shout out, uh, shout out Dracula. I mean, I'm glad you brought that up here in, in the closing thoughts because um, I think on chain TikTok's huge opportunity. I don't know if you saw, but they just announced like an on chain creator fund. I think you should oh, definitely wow. apply for it. I think anyone that's listening to this should definitely apply for it. And again, just to kind of wrap it up here, I love that you're just going for it. You know, you're releasing music on sound, you're building a brand on Warpcast, you're posting videos on Dracula. You know, for any artist that's listening to this podcast, this is basically the epitome of what it means to be building a brand on chain today is like all this shit's new. People are figuring out new ways to sell their music. I think a lot of people put their music on sound. And they just go like, why isn't anyone mincing it? And what I tell them is like, yo, if you want to get people to mint your music, you got to go and meet them where they're at. You got to go and meet people where they're minting shit. And that doesn't mean you need to go on Twitter space and talk about why you love the latest and greatest ordinals drop or something like that. It means just be vocal about your project, like post about it on the sound feed, post about it on Warpcast, go and make videos on Dracula, do all the shit that you're already doing as an artist on TikTok, on Instagram, et cetera, but just put it on chain, put the content where people who are already collecting are, and they're going to meet you that that halfway and they're going to tip you for your shit. So um, really glad we got a chance to do this episode, man. You know, one thing I'll say here is that uh, you mentioned that you've been listening to the podcast and that you've been a follower and a supporter of it. That means a ton to me. I'm really glad that we were able to get you on this episode here. And I'm excited for us to look back at this episode of Tools in six, 12 months and just see how much further along the project has come. So 
thank you for being on here, man. I'm excited for people to listen to this. Hell yeah, man. I'm I'm honored to I'm honored that you asked me to come on and um I'm happy that I'm happy that we were able to talk and get some of these thoughts out there. It's really cool, man. And I appreciate what you're doing in the space, putting artists on and uh, showing everybody how it's done. Plenty more where that came from. Well, hey, as a listening to this, Tool 002 Synchronicity out now on Sound.xyz, Tools FML on Warpcast. Go follow it, and we will talk to you guys soon. Peace out, everybody. Oh, yeah.